Thermodynamics All right, let's start. Thermodynamics is the science of the flow of heat. Thermal is heat and dynamic is the motion. Thermodynamics was developed, largely beginning in the 1800s, at the time of the Industrial Revolution, the taming of the fuel, the beginning of generating power by burning fossil fuel. So anyway, thermodynamics states from the same period as getting fossil fuels out of the ground. It's universal. Turns out everything around us moves energy around one way or the other through biological systems like burning calories, burning ATP, creating heat. You're warm-blooded animals. You need energy to move move your arms around, move around, in the chemical systems obviously carbs, ketos and etc., and even in the astrophysics when we talk about stars, black holes and etc. you're moving energy around, you're moving heat around and you're changing matter through thermodynamic, and the concepts of thermodynamics have even been applied to economics, these things are in the eye of big companies like Enron, you know completely out of equilibrium, the fine equilibrium economics or non-equilibrium economics. Thermodynamics All right let's start. Thermodynamics is the science of the flow of heat. Thermal is heat and dynamic is the motion. Thermodynamics was developed, largely beginning in the 1800s, at the time of the Industrial Revolution, the taming of the fuel, the beginning of generating power by burning fossil fuel. So anyway thermodynamics states from the same period as, getting fossil fuels out of the ground. It's universal. Turns out everything around us moves energy around one way or the other through biological systems like burning calories, burning ATP, creating heat. You're warm-blooded animals. You need energy to move your arms around, move around, in the chemical systems obviously carbs, ketos and etc., and even in the astrophysics when we talk about stars, black holes and etc. you're moving energy around, you're moving heat around and you're changing matter through thermodynamic, and the concepts of thermodynamics have even been applied to economics, these things are in the eye of big companies like Enron, you know completely out of equilibrium, the fine equilibrium economics or non-equilibrium economics. How can we learn anything from animals if we don't examine their behavior? Because we want to know why animals do what they do. Many more motivations exist for researching animal behavior. If conservation biologists want to conserve animals, they need to know what they do themselves. Are these creatures sociable or lone wolf? Do they have enough room, and how many of their peers do they share it with? There are occasions when the results of a study can't be predicted. For a long time, Fernando Notterbaum was fascinated by how birds choose their songs. However, his study ended up reshaping the entire field of neurobiology in a way that was completely unexpected but incredibly enormous. And here is John Alcock's course textbook. How quickly a field animal's behavior changes is demonstrated by the fact that this is now in its ninth print version. There are a lot of new things going on out there. How can we learn anything from animals if we don't examine their behavior? Because we want to know why animals do what they do. Many more motivations exist for researching animal behavior. If conservation biologists want to conserve animals, they need to know what they do themselves. Are these creatures sociable or lone wolf? Do they have enough room, and how many of their peers do they share it with? 
There are occasions when the results of a study can't be predicted. For a long time, Fernando Notterbaum was fascinated by how birds choose their songs. However, his study ended up reshaping the entire field of neurobiology in a way that was completely unexpected but incredibly enormous. And here is John Alcock's course textbook. How quickly a field animal's behavior changes is demonstrated by the fact that this is now in its ninth print version. There are a lot of new things going on out there. We've discovered that the makeup of ecosystems all throughout the world is changing at a considerably faster rate than we anticipated. Certainly, far faster than ecological theory anticipates. Anne McGurran of the University of St Andrews in Scotland is a biologist. We still don't know what will happen as a result of this. We believe it will be linked to a decrease in resilience in these assemblages, but there are still many unanswered concerns concerning the repercussions of such fast biodiversity change. And what this means is that if we care about conservation, we must do more than simply list species. Changes in the abundances and identities of the species that live in these environments must also be tracked. Conservation biologists will need to keep note of the species they encounter in these locations. And policymakers will have to be willing to adjust their policies to reflect these developments. McGurran and colleagues are working to create the BioTime database, a storehouse for data on ecological groups and populations, as well as how they are evolving through time. At the World Economic Forum in Davos on January 26, McGurran chatted with Scientific American Editor-in-Chief Mariette Di Cristina. MD, I'm a medical doctor, and the data set will be available soon? A. M. Yes, the data set will be made public. It's an open access data set, which means it may be used for study, teaching, and conservation by anybody in the globe. And we'd be glad to work with anyone who has data and wants to join us or contribute in any manner to the data set's preservation. We've discovered that the makeup of ecosystems all throughout the world is changing at a considerably faster rate than we anticipated. Certainly, far faster than ecological theory anticipates. Anne McGurran of the University of St Andrews in Scotland is a biologist. We still don't know what will happen as a result of this. We believe it will be linked to a decrease in resilience in these assemblages, but there are still many unanswered concerns concerning the repercussions of such fast biodiversity change. And what this means is that if we care about conservation, we must do more than simply list species. Changes in the abundances and identities of the species that live in these environments must also be tracked. Conservation biologists will need to keep note of the species they encounter in these locations. And policymakers will have to be willing to adjust their policies to reflect these developments. McGurran and colleagues are working to create the BioTime database, a storehouse for data on ecological groups and populations, as well as how they are evolving through time. At the World Economic Forum in Davos on January 26, McGurran chatted with Scientific American Editor-in-Chief Mariette Di Cristina. MD, I'm a medical doctor, and the data set will be available soon? A. M. Yes, the data set will be made public. It's an open access data set, which means it may be used for study, teaching, and conservation by anybody in the globe. And we'd be glad to work with anyone who has data and wants to join us or contribute in any manner to the data set's preservation. A testimony to how adept algorithms have become at analyzing human looks is the fact that both Google and Facebook can successfully recognize your pals in images. If an algorithm were placed against specialists who testify in court, how would it fare? Apparently, the best algorithm is just as good as the greatest people. National Institute of Standards and Technology scientist Jonathan Phillips works on facial recognition systems. 
To test the abilities of humans and machines, he and his colleagues provided 20 challenging picture pairings. And it turned out that the most recent algorithms did just as well as highly trained people. With two individuals or an algorithm, the combination of human and machine judgments won out, producing near-perfect findings that shows that combining the capabilities of human brains with computer code adds up to higher accuracy, as demonstrated in this study. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences Journal published the research. Using these insights, Phillips argues, is now the responsibility of the facial recognition community. Human recognizers aren't going anywhere anytime soon, either. It's not enough to merely accept an algorithm's word for it, you must build techniques to include human judgment into the algorithm's decision-making process. Finally, a somebody, preferably a human, will have to testify in court on the results. A testimony to how adept algorithms have become at analyzing human looks is the fact that both Google and Facebook can successfully recognize your pals in images. If an algorithm were placed against specialists who testify in court, how would it fare? Apparently, the best algorithm is just as good as the greatest people. National Institute of Standards and Technology scientist Jonathan Phillips works on facial recognition systems. To test the abilities of humans and machines, he and his colleagues provided 20 challenging picture pairings. And it turned out that the most recent algorithms did just as well as highly trained people. With two individuals or an algorithm, the combination of human and machine judgments won out, producing near-perfect findings that shows that combining the capabilities of human brains with computer code adds up to higher accuracy, as demonstrated in this study. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences Journal published the research. Using these insights, Phillips argues, is now the responsibility of the facial recognition community. Human recognizers aren't going anywhere anytime soon, either. It's not enough to merely accept an algorithm's word for it, you must build techniques to include human judgment into the algorithm's decision-making process. Finally, a somebody, preferably a human, will have to testify in court on the results. When we speak a language, we are compelled by its structure to pay attention to specific facets of that language's structure. Thinking for speaking hypothesis is what it's known as. Evidence suggests that language simulates images and that this has an impact on how we experience events. Color is a very complicated visual phenomenon. The process through which your brain decodes color is pretty convoluted. Gru is a name used in several languages to refer to a color that is both green and blue. In Namibian Plains dialects like the Himba, you'll discover this. In this experiment, participants were asked to gaze at a color tile for 30 seconds before being shown the complete spectrum of colors and being instructed to select the one they just saw. This is a challenging assignment for English speakers, but it is a piece of cake for someone who speaks Himba, for whom this color is sacred. It is impossible to distinguish colors that aren't expressed in your first language.
When we speak a language, we are compelled by its structure to pay attention to specific facets of that language's structure. Thinking for speaking hypothesis is what it's known as. Evidence suggests that language simulates images and that this has an impact on how we experience events. Color is a very complicated visual phenomenon. The process through which your brain decodes color is pretty convoluted. Gru is a name used in several languages to refer to a color that is both green and blue. In Namibian Plains dialects like the Himba, you'll discover this. In this experiment, participants were asked to gaze at a color tile for 30 seconds before being shown the complete spectrum of colors and being instructed to select the one they just saw. This is a challenging assignment for English speakers, but it is a piece of cake for someone who speaks Himba, for whom this color is sacred. It is impossible to distinguish colors that aren't expressed in your first language. There are several reasons why Melk is not like other monasteries. To begin with, it is extraordinarily large, something that succeeding foundations, in particular, lacked. As a second point, it was formed in the countryside, although many foundations were established in towns in the 17th and 18th centuries. Even after centuries of abandonment, the monastery still possesses a significant amount of property, as it is located within Austria, the only European nation where big ancient monasteries have been in continuous existence since they were built 900,000 or even 1200 years ago. There are several reasons why Melk is not like other monasteries. To begin with, it is extraordinarily large, something that succeeding foundations, in particular, lacked. As a second point, it was formed in the countryside, although many foundations were established in towns in the 17th and 18th centuries. Even after centuries of abandonment, the monastery still possesses a significant amount of property, as it is located within Austria, the only European nation where big ancient monasteries have been in continuous existence since they were built 900,000 or even 1200 years ago. During sleep deprivation investigations, scientists employ a method known as psychomotor vigilance tasks, or private. It's a simple response test, a red button turns green at random, and participants have to press it as quickly as they can. Over a two-week period, people who obtain eight hours of sleep a night exhibit no gaps in concentration or cognitive deficits. Those who get six or four hours of sleep a night, on the other hand, see their private values decline practically every day throughout the whole two-week period. For obvious reasons, the four-hour group is the least successful. Microsleeps, on the other hand, are full breaks in consciousness that reflect a lack of attention. To put it another way, their brains aren't simply working slower, they're also shutting down. If you receive six hours of sleep for 10 consecutive days, you're effectively sleeping for 24 hours straight, according to studies. That's the same level of impairment as being above the legal limit of alcohol. It's as if you haven't slept for 48 hours straight if you only get four hours of sleep a night for 11 days.
During sleep deprivation investigations, scientists employ a method known as psychomotor vigilance tasks, or private. It's a simple response test, a red button turns green at random, and participants have to press it as quickly as they can. Over a two-week period, people who obtain eight hours of sleep a night exhibit no gaps in concentration or cognitive deficits. Those who get six or four hours of sleep a night, on the other hand, see their private values decline practically every day throughout the whole two-week period. For obvious reasons, the four-hour group is the least successful. Microsleeps, on the other hand, are full breaks in consciousness that reflect a lack of attention. To put it another way, their brains aren't simply working slower, they're also shutting down. If you receive six hours of sleep for 10 consecutive days, you're effectively sleeping for 24 hours straight, according to studies. That's the same level of impairment as being above the legal limit of alcohol. It's as if you haven't slept for 48 hours straight if you only get four hours of sleep a night for 11 days. I believe that for the vast majority of us, the first test of a piece of art, literature, or music is how much pleasure it brings us, and we don't want to deal with studying why or how it affected us. It's always a good idea to know what you like in the positive sense, rather of just focusing on what you don't like and moaning about it, even if there's some pleasure in it. But now that you've decided to take a novel course, I'm afraid that judging literature based on your own feelings toward a book will not count as an informed critical reaction to the work being studied. However, it is helpful to be reminded from time to time that we are all susceptible to rubbish. When it comes to music, for example, you could love listening to a catchy pop song, but you might have a hard time arguing that it's better than anything else just because it's fun to hear. So, among other things, you've come to sharpen your vital knives. I believe that for the vast majority of us, the first test of a piece of art, literature, or music is how much pleasure it brings us, and we don't want to deal with studying why or how it affected us. It's always a good idea to know what you like in the positive sense, rather of just focusing on what you don't like and moaning about it, even if there's some pleasure in it. But now that you've decided to take a novel course, I'm afraid that judging literature based on your own feelings toward a book will not count as an informed critical reaction to the work being studied. However, it is helpful to be reminded from time to time that we are all susceptible to rubbish. When it comes to music, for example, you could love listening to a catchy pop song, but you might have a hard time arguing that it's better than anything else just because it's fun to hear. So, among other things, you've come to sharpen your vital knives. Our topic for today's lesson is Nevada's prehistoric inhabitants. In fact, the vast majority of these prehistoric desert nomads were constantly on the move. Isn't it possible to consider that they were wasting their time? In reality, they had a well-thought-out strategy in place. Their movements were dictated by the availability of food, such as ripening plants or fish breeding grounds. There were occasions when these people had to travel a considerable distance and needed to store more food and supplies in caverns or beneath rocks. Archaeological digs are now being conducted in one of these caves. A large underground grotto may be found beyond its narrow entrance. However, despite the cave's size, it was too dark and filthy for the visitors to dwell in, but it was an excellent spot to conceal items and a treasure trove of food and antiquities has been discovered there. Dried fish, seeds, and nuts are among the items on the menu. Stone spear points and knives were found among the relics, however the spear points themselves were rather tiny. The ones that were found can be shown here. When viewed in relation to the hands that are holding them, their size is apparent.
Our topic for today's lesson is Nevada's prehistoric inhabitants. In fact, the vast majority of these prehistoric desert nomads were constantly on the move. Isn't it possible to consider that they were wasting their time? In reality, they had a well-thought-out strategy in place. Their movements were dictated by the availability of food, such as ripening plants or fish breeding grounds. There were occasions when these people had to travel a considerable distance and needed to store more food and supplies in caverns or beneath rocks. Archaeological digs are now being conducted in one of these caves. A large underground grotto may be found beyond its narrow entrance. However, despite the cave's size, it was too dark and filthy for the visitors to dwell in, but it was an excellent spot to conceal items and a treasure trove of food and antiquities has been discovered there. Dried fish, seeds, and nuts are among the items on the menu. Stone spear points and knives were found among the relics, however the spear points themselves were rather tiny. The ones that were found can be shown here. When viewed in relation to the hands that are holding them, their size is apparent. Welsh is a Celtic language that is spoken by around 740,000 people in Wales and by a few hundred individuals in the Welsh colony in Patagonia, Argentina. The Welsh language is also spoken in the United Kingdom, UK, Canada, Canada, the United States, USA, Australia, Australia, and New Zealand. About half of the inhabitants of Wales spoke Welsh as their primary language at the beginning of the 20th century. There were only approximately 20% Welsh speakers in Britain by the end of the century. 582,368 individuals can speak Welsh, 659,301 can read or write it, and 797,717 claim some knowledge of the language. 28% of the population claim to know some Welsh. S4C, the Welsh language TV station, conducted a poll that found that there are around 750,000 Welsh speakers in Wales and that approximately 1.5 million people can comprehend Welsh. Moreover 133,000 Welsh speakers reside in the United Kingdom, with roughly 50,000 of them concentrated in the London region. Welsh is a Celtic language that is spoken by around 740,000 people in Wales and by a few hundred individuals in the Welsh colony in Patagonia, Argentina. The Welsh language is also spoken in the United Kingdom, UK, Canada, Canada, the United States, USA, Australia, Australia, and New Zealand. About half of the inhabitants of Wales spoke Welsh as their primary language at the beginning of the 20th century. There were only approximately 20% Welsh speakers in Britain by the end of the century. 582,368 individuals can speak Welsh, 659,301 can read or write it, and 797,717 claim some knowledge of the language. 28% of the population claim to know some Welsh. S4C, the Welsh language TV station, conducted a poll that found that there are around 750,000 Welsh speakers in Wales and that approximately 1.5 million people can comprehend Welsh. Moreover 133,000 Welsh speakers reside in the United Kingdom, with roughly 50,000 of them concentrated in the London region.